Cargo and I are going to stand. At least I'm going to stand. I don't. I don't, don't know what he might do. But <laughs> anyway, uh, welcome everybody to this symposium. Uh, I'm certainly pleased to have been invited to take part in this. Uh, dogs have always been a major role in my life, as my dad was an RCMP dog handler. And being posted in rural detachments meant that all of our, uh, or our two German Shepherd dogs played a significant role always in our lives. Dogs were ever present in my life from then on. While teaching, I was always keen on learning about the huge impact that educators felt dogs could have on children with emotional and physical issues. I realized early in that not every dog has the inherent capabilities to deal with the tasks required to be a therapy dog. I am so lucky because out of all the number of dogs that I've owned that my Great Pyrenees Bear and Bernese Mountain Dog Cargo had the qualities to become awesome therapy dogs. Being smart, stoic, uh, patient, and dependable were all definite indicators. Both Cargo and Bear were enrolled in Manitoba Search and Rescue Elite Canine Therapy Program that consisted of six month long modules, conditioning the dog to being tolerant of hands-on, um, sorry, of hands-on experience, teaching basic commands and obedience, knowing how to act in public without uh, distraction, being able to handle all types of situations in various environments and knowing how to act and react appropriately were all crucial qualities in the therapy dog setting. Uh, learning canine first aid and standard first aid and CPR were also requirements for me as a handler. In 2007, Bear and I struck out on an adventure that took us into numerous schools in the Louis Riel School Division and a myriad of experiments. With his calm demeanor and non-judgmental manner, Bear brightened the days for students, parents, and staff. Recess duty activities, Christmas concerts, school picnics, field days, and even parent interviews were all part of Bear's domain. Andrea Sloan, a St. Mont group home coordinator, approached me about the possibility of Bear visiting their group homes. This turned out to be a very worthwhile and enjoyable venture bringing lots of smiles and laughter to all concerned. These visits are still ongoing. I was brokenhearted to lose Bear to cancer in 2014 after working alongside of him for seven years. The outpouring of grief from so many people, young and old, and in so many various ways, made me realize that Bear indeed had created a legacy. In September 2014, Cargo and I set out into the schools determined to continue on with the amazing experiences that had gone before us with Bear. Cargo has been awesome in stepping up to fill Bear's paw prints. While attending to listening, um, while attending to listening to little kids read, Cargo has been instrumental in teaching them that pet ownership is indeed a huge responsibility. He's still here. <laughs> <laughs> Empathy, proper handling, proper diet, good health practices, exercise, and safety precautions have all been emphasized. In a number of cases, children have been able to overcome their fear of big dogs and yet learn how to protect themselves in the presence of animals that are not they are not familiar with. Cargo has also proven to be a very valuable resource when dealing with children from different ethnic backgrounds who do not as yet feel comfortable conversing in English. He is attentive and accepting of all their feelings and stories, no matter what the language might be, and for sure, the signs of love and affection are universal. This June, Car Cargo and I are hanging up the best. The bear and cargo journey has lasted nine years and has proven to me that dogs, uh, that dogs have an invaluable impact on many little lives. In closing, I'd like to share this quote with you. 
My goal in life is to be as good a person as my dog already thinks I am. <laughs> That was uh, wonderful for you to share your story of, of Carlo and Bear and all their hard work. Um, I'd like to pass the mic over to, or if you could pass the mic over to Anita. Um, we'll hear from her. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Andrea mentioned, I had my dog Charlie at St. Dumont for several years, and um, my um, therapy dog training experience is quite a bit different than Barb's and Cargo. Um, I really uh, have always loved dogs, and unfortunately I couldn't have a dog until I was almost 40. We never had pets growing up, especially dogs. Um, so, but I always really, really wanted to have a dog. I had to wait a long time. But, and then even when I went to, when we wanted to adopt one from a shelter, so I really didn't have much experience with it, didn't really know what I was doing, so we really, really lucked out with this dog, Charlie. He was just kind of this cute chocolate lab cross we saw in Pet Finders. I thought, oh, let's go meet him. And he seemed really friendly. And um, I also was interested in I used to watch a show called Dogs with Jobs all the time. I thought, wouldn't it be cool to have a dog you could take to work or someplace and just do more with it than just have it as a pet? So, um, and again, like we didn't really know uh, what kind of dog we were getting, but uh, luckily Charlie turned out to be just the most chill, laid back, just easygoing dog you could ever imagine. We actually thought they lied about his age because he was so calm. But uh, he was about seven months when we got him. And um, because his temperament seemed so nice, I thought, well, it'd be nice to try to bring him to work um, or get him into some type of therapy capacity. But this was 10 years ago already. There wasn't really much out there, and I didn't really know what was out there. And then luckily at that time, St. Amant, someone had just brought in uh, someone from St. John Ambulance with their therapy dog. So they started the program there just as, uh, as I had Charlie. So I thought, well, I think that would be a good avenue. And then, but before that, it's funny because with Search and Rescue, there was an article in the paper and it had, was looking for dog, uh, people to get their dogs involved in their therapy dog program. And it was, um, so these two things happened at the same time. So we were just kind of deciding which one to do. And with St. John's, it's an afternoon of certain tests they give the dogs. And with, um, as you heard from Barb, with Search and Rescue, it's six months. So we just finished this real nightmare of a obedience training class with our dog, Charlie. So we thought, let's just do the afternoon. So um, with St. John Ambulance, um, it's mostly like a temperament test and um, you apply to be a volunteer with St. John Ambulance. And the type of tests they do are mostly, um, it's about an afternoon and there's about five or six other dogs in the room and they want to see how you handle your dog, if, you, if it listens to you, if it walks nicely on a leash. If you can control it from playing with uh, the other dogs in the room, if it gets excited, uh, if you can calm it down right away. Also, they try to simulate things that happen, you know, out in the field, like many, um, like nursing homes, hospitals, places like St. Amant will request St. John ambulance dogs to come. So it's a different environment than most dogs would be used to, obviously. So they would have, um, like, the dog walk through a crowd of people walking kind of strangely, um, or people with walkers, and then they'd have um, other volunteers just they'd pet the dog with kind of a shaky hand, uh, just to sort of simulate what, what they would see out in different facilities where they might be going. So, um, and the weather temperament is like too, because we do have, um, when Charlie was about six, we adopted another dog that I thought she could be taking his place eventually, but uh, as it turned out, like she was just um, a little too nervous for it, because we did the test with her as well, and they had changed it a little bit when we did it with Charlie, because my husband uh, volunteers to take him as well. Um, we took turns doing each of the tests, and there's about, I don't know, six or seven or eight different little tests that they give them, and then 
they changed it where the both people volunteers have to do. So she had to do each test twice, and it was just really too much for her. So she just looked really scared and terrified, so I thought this is probably not going to be a lot of fun for her. So she, she probably, um, we probably won't be trying again with her. Um, but since then, we did um, just recently adopt a new little puppy, so she seems to have a really nice temperament, and I'm hoping down the road that I can do this again, because it was so nice to have Charlie have that designation, not only to have him, I did bring him to work um, with me for several years, but uh, through St. John's, we also took him to certain um, nursing homes would request, flu clinics would often request uh, therapy dogs to come, um, the U of M and I think the uh, Red River College would request dogs to come for when they have exams to sort of help the students with their exam, exam anxiety. So there's a whole bunch of different things that they would request you to do with the dogs. So, but with um, specifically at St. Amant is where I had them the most because obviously like I work there so it was the easiest thing to do. It was, I was really lucky to do it because to have your dog at work was just, it was so nice to have them there. And then the last two years, I was lucky enough again, my boss uh, had a sub come in for me for an afternoon a week. So like prior to that, I would just bring them and sort of see where I could fit in therapy while I was doing my own job. But with this, I could have an afternoon to just focus on um, just pet therapy, just identify kids that needed the pet therapy in different ways. And it could be really largely dependent on the type of student. So sometimes it would just be socialization, just to pet the dog. You know, the student really enjoys dogs, respond. Some wouldn't respond to really anything much other than the dog. So it was kind of nice you could just lie down and cuddle with them. And, and they could just have a nice relaxing afternoon. Um, with other students who were more social, uh, they would like to take his leash and you know, they'd go for walks around the building and, and dogs are a good conversation starter. So for students that are social, then they have social opportunities. Um, and then some uh, academic, you know, with uh, there was one student that uh, was a little bit anxious with reading, so she uh, was a little bit more relaxed and could learn a little bit more easily with with him around. And um, and the other students were just not comfortable with dogs at all. They were a little bit anxious. So um, you know, he was a really gentle dog. So you know, after spending more time with him and nothing bad happened, then he would get eventually a little bit more comfortable with dogs around. And he could do tricks, like dog tricks are always like a big hit with anybody and they're pretty easy to teach your dog. Um, or with groups, they would, uh, you could have symbols, uh, at special education, so a lot of the communication symbols are used so they could do, choose which dog's trick they'd like him to do. Or, you know, Charlie could also, he learned to hit a, a switch or a voice recorded output so he could greet people, he'd take part in the daily calendar, and sort of be more a part of their lives. Um, and currently, like since Charlie is uh, not around anymore, we do have another, like for the literacy class that I teach, we do have a, another St. John Ambulance dog that comes to visit, so it's really nice to continue that. And another way I've tried to fill the gap of my dog drought is uh, there's a local rescue that has a, a cute program called Puppies on the Payroll. So I just, uh, was just a donation, they'll have somebody from the rescue come out and bring a couple of puppies, just to spend about half an hour, 45 minutes with your, whatever workplace you have. So mine was the classroom, so that was a really fun way to, to bring dogs back in the classroom. But uh, yeah, really nice to have them there. And that's my story, thank you very much. about Charlie and all the great work that he uh, he did at the school. Um, before we hand it over to Kristen, we're just going to start a uh, show you guys a slideshow um, on um, uh, Kristen's son and his service dog.
So my son is Madden. He was diagnosed at the age of two. He is now seven. Uh, we were on the wait list for the ADA program through St. Amant for a year. And then once we started the program, we started seeing quite a bit of progress with communication, academics, but something was still missing and we couldn't figure out what it was. He was still having a lot of trouble when we were out in public, a lot of transitional issues. Uh, sleep was still very hard. We knew a couple of other families who had service dogs who had success. So we applied to MSAR to see if we would qualify and if it would be a good fit. Uh, we were able to go and meet Mac when Mac uh, was about just after he turned three. Um, that's an art nerd. <laughs> um, so he turned three and we started the program, uh, the meeting Mac. He was only a puppy. Um, so we stayed in training for about a year. We would drive in. We live about an hour and a half away from Winnipeg. And we would drive in to meet Mac and his trainer at various places in Winnipeg, uh, often like mall, restaurants, grocery stores, everyday activities that Madden had a lot of difficulties with. They're waiting for the bus. The first picture is waiting for his grandpa to get a citizenship. <laughs> um, so now it's time to take our dog home, and we brought him home, and it wasn't going well. They, Madden had no connection to him. He was very in disinterested. He didn't want the dog to touch him. He didn't like the way the dog smelled, nothing. So what are we gonna do? We fundraised for this dog, we had socials, we put a lot of time and effort. So we took the ABA principles that we've practiced with St. Amant after two years and applied them to the dog and Madden together. So we used a lot of positive reinforcement for Madden with the dog. So if you play with your dog, you can have access to your iPad. You can play with your dog, you can go and get a treat from the store. As long as you were doing it with your dog, you would be reinforced. And it took about maybe six months, so about once we figured out that we had to reinforce the two together, um, for their bond to solidify. And now they are inseparable. Uh, so the biggest issues we had problems with were sleep and transitions, which the dog helped immensely. We went from the average of three to four hours a night sleep, waking up with night terrors and screaming for about three to four hours, five days a week, to once a month. So they sleep together. At first the dog did sleep in a kennel in our son's room with the door open and it was up to them where each of them slept. Um, so for the first little while, they were separate. Our son was on the bed, the dog was in his kennel. Some nights the dog was on the bed, Madden was in the kennel. <laughs> they wouldn't sleep together. So then we removed his kennel and they started sleeping together and sleep got better, significantly. Because sleep got better, ABA got better. Learning got better. Temperament was better. Behavior was better. Everything was better. So then we had to work on transitions. We live in a small community with modular classrooms, meaning we have to walk outside to go from one building to another. Well, that for Madden was extremely difficult. There was no point in going outside and walking to your next classroom. Usually would have his, at the time, our ABA tutor was in our school, would have to pick him up and carry him, screaming and crying, to get from one class to another. We couldn't go from our door to our driveway without a tantrum. Madden can now go on a 45 minute hike, an hour walk. The dog gave him a lot of purpose, right? It's purposeful to go and walk your dog, right? It wasn't purposeful for him to walk to the store but it is purposeful to take your dog for a walk to the store and then get a drink. Um, and even the confidence that the dog gave him when we were out in public, uh, people were now looking at Madden. Madden was now looking back at them. The dog provided him with this confidence to be out in public. Again, it's purposeful to be out because you are walking your dog when you're out in public. So for him, it made a lot of sense that 
If I'm out and walking my dog, I don't need to be upset and having a tantrum. I'm going somewhere, often to get some, a treat. Um, and then about a year later, we brought Mac into school with Madden. So a year after our training, so we stayed home for about six months with him and then introduced him to school. He goes to school, he goes to soccer, he goes to swimming, he goes everywhere Madden goes. He's not here today, with, the dog's not here today because he's at school with Madden. Um, for the most part, it's been a huge adjustment to having a dog. We weren't dog people. <laughs> we are now. Uh, and our son too, he didn't like the dog and now he loves him. And it was great to see the, him go through the changes with the dog and to be accepting and uh, to find comfort in his dog, which he does. Um, some of the biggest challenges that we face uh, with having a service dog is public access. So oftentimes when we're out, we do draw a lot of attention. People want to see us, people want to talk to us, they want to touch the dog. The dog, Mac wears a vest that says, do not pet, do not feed, and everybody wants to pet the dog. It's quite different from a, ser a therapy dog or from even your normal dog, like everyday dog. People feel that they're entitled to pet your dog when we're out. And it's hard, some people are not very accepting when you tell them, no, you can't pet our dog. They are upset, they're offended, they want to know what his medical conditions are, they want to know why we have the dog, what's the dog for, and unfortunately, for a majority of the time, our answer is, it's not your business. Like, he is here providing a service. Um, we do try to accept a few questions. We do want to put it out there and educate people on that service dogs are becoming more popular in our community and they are necessary for people. Um, but, you're asking us our son's medical history in front of our son who is a nonverbal child. So just because he's not talking doesn't mean he doesn't understand what we're saying. And you're basically just talking about him in front of him rather than talking to him. If he wanted to divulge the information, if he could, he would. If he didn't want to, he wouldn't have to. So it's not up to us to decide for him that we can let everybody know his medical history. Um, we've had it a few places that we've gone where we've been requested to leave because dogs are not permitted, which according to the company that we've gone through, we are permitted and we do have a card stating that we are a certified through this company. Unfortunately, this company is not acknowledged in our entire province, in our country, or on our continent, right? So I mean, just because our company says that we're certified and we're good to go, we are not openly accepted everywhere. We've been requested to leave a few times. Most of the time we just have to tell them that this is a medical service dog and usually that's the end of it and we've had it happen once where they insisted we leave and we had to contact a lawyer. Um, but for the most part, it's great. They're great together, they're cute. He's a big anchor. Like our son isn't very big on running but every once in a while he gets the urge, he has to ask to let go of his dog. So if we are somewhere that's busy, he knows he has to hold on to Mac to make sure that he's safe. Um, our school that he attends is right on the number one highway. Um, so we have a lot of traffic. So again, like at recess, he knows he's gotta stay within distance of his dog. He has to ask to leave the dog when he's walking from classroom to classroom. Um, safety was a big concern. We live close to a lake and unfortunately many children with autism are drawn to water and that was one of our biggest concerns that he would want to go swimming on a daily basis and the dog will help keep him in the perimeter of our yard. Uh, we live in a provincial park, we're not allowed to have fences, um, so we really are gambling with him being outside knowing his limit. If I take my eyes off him for a second, he potentially has the risk of being gone. 
So the dog helps with that, and it's keeping him safe. with Mac. Of all the things being in the public, I thought for sure people wanting to pet the dog, but I never would have thought of people um, wanting to know information about your son and, and what his diagnosis is and what the purpose of the dog is. So very uh, enlightening. So thank you. Hi there. My name is Doug Anderson. I work with uh, we have a new name now, it's Manitoba Education and Training. We're back to that one, as of yesterday. Um, I, had, uh, I always get stuck with the uh, real exciting topics, legal and administrative aspects of service animals. And I was worried that I wouldn't be able to make too many connections, but Kristen really set this one up nicely. Did you know what the, uh, you know what the fine is for petting a service dog in Manitoba? $5,000. Anyway, I'll, I'll go through some of this, I'll read it. I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an expert on, it, on service animals, but I've been involved with uh, worries, sort of, that the dispute resolution that I work with would end up with a complaint from a parent about it, an animal in the school. So I was trying to figure out how, how we handle that, and that's what led me to my interest in this topic. Um, I won't speak about the dogs that are accompanied by handlers, because they're usually covered off with principal permission. Um, we have policies in schools like uh, animals in schools, and that usually gets taken care of that way. But I will talk about service animals. So in Manitoba, we have two pieces of legislation that cover service animals. The Service Animals Protection Act makes it an offense to touch, feed, or interfere with a service animal, A, that is trained to be used by a person with a disability, B, or trained to be used as a peace officer, or C, trained to be used by a person to assist police peace officers. First offense fine, $5,000. Second and subsequent fine, $10,000 each time. I don't think any, any judge ever comes up with those. So. The Human Rights Code prohibits discrimination and harassment in employment, housing, or when services are being offered to the public based on 13 characteristics, which include physical or mental disability or related characteristics or circumstances including reliance on a service animal. The Human Rights Code defines a service animal as an animal that's been trained to provide assistance to a person with a disability that relates to that person's disability. Uh, these animals have the right to enter public establishments and must be allowed access to hotels, restaurants, taxis, etc. And I think over the years we've heard some of the, some of the stuff that hits the media about taxis refusing that people ride as a result. Um, animals that provide comfort or companionship but are not trained to assist a person with a disability are not service animals under the code. But there is a duty to accommodate these animals, giving them access to services available to the public. Depending on their disability and training, therapy dogs may fit into either definition. Uh, the Human Rights Code has stated there's only two questions that may be asked of a person with a dog in a public place. Is the dog assisting a person with a disability? And what service is the dog trained to provide? Uh, Human Rights Commission, in 2014 they had a uh, consultation on um, service animals because the Human Rights Issues Committee identified growing confusion about the rights of individuals who use service animals and organize public consultations. As a result, they came up with a whole bunch of issues. Uh, difficulties accessing public spaces, a need for clarity about what is a service animal. Service animals should be consistently identified. Any training program sh should be consistent, but to what standard? That's just four of them. A couple comments that came out of there. The uh, chairperson of the Human Rights Committee is a uh, a used dog user herself, and she said the most important message that it is that something must be done to address the need for more information about the use of service animals in public places. And one of the service providers that sits on our committee now, um, he made the comment, service providers need to the right information so that they can do the right thing. And there's a lot of deceit that goes on sometimes. 
city of Winnipeg, I think, gives out uh, free dog licenses for service dogs. And uh, the person in charge of the city flooded with requests with people coming to them with, with untrained dogs, but wanting them to uh, escape that fee. So, Human Rights Commission uh, actions to date, they reviewed and updated their policies. They developed fact sheets for service animals and comfort animals and human rights code. They also developed service animal um, guides for employers, service providers, venues, landlords, schools, and for landlords of tenants with comfort animals. I'll uh, give you a better definition of, of um, well, comfort animals, not a service animal. It's not trained to help someone with a disability. Uh, one of the revised policies was a practical guide for schools, students with service animals. And they also established a service animal working group, which uh, I was asked to, or I, I sort of volunteered to sit on it from the department. The purpose is to discuss the rights of service animal users, the responsibility of service providers, and the elimination of barriers for service animal users. Considering whether <coughs> educational programs will be sufficient or whether certification and the standardized identification programs are needed. So that's, that's some heated discussion that's going on amongst that group now. Topics of discussion, what's a service animal, what's a uh, comfort, comfort and companion animal. One uh, example that I, I heard of in one of our schools in the province was there were two dogs in the school. Uh, one was a service animal, well behaved. The other one was said to be a service animal by the parent, but, but that dog attacked the service animal. So they found out afterwards it wasn't that well trained, it was a comfort animal uh, working with one student, and as a result, the service animal was attacked in the hallway at school. So that's an example of the level of training of some of these dogs. Uh, there's, there's a need for national standards for certification of service animals. There are none, but I'll comment on that further afterwards. Um, service animals in Manitoba don't require certification or identification. Service animals in Manitoba have no requirement for a certain level of training. They may even include self-trained animals. So some school people and, and other institutions are left scratching their head, well, you know, where are the standards in all this? Federally, there's presently no national standards for service animals, but last week I was informed that the Canadian General Standards Board Technical Committee has drafted national standards for service dogs and they should be out in 14 months. Hopefully this will clear up the portability of certification across provincial barriers and ensure that persons with disabilities have the right to move within and between jurisdictions without undue barriers placed in their way. I also realize it's just going to make all the time that I spend on that committee a waste of total waste of time because the federal government's going to come out and supersede us anyway. Uh, other provinces, uh, this came from our working group, uh, Alberta provides blind and disabled persons with ID cards for service dogs as proof of training, but only by assistance dogs international certified facilities. Individual with uh, disability has the same rights as someone without a dog um, under that legislation. There's a fine of $3,000, up to $3,000 for service provider offenses if someone <coughs> deliberately refused them access to a, a facility and up to $300 for users. I guess that could include fraudulent dogs. But I've been told that Alberta is reviewing this requirement and may soon face a court challenge on its uh, Assistance Dogs International limitations to certification. Uh, I guess there's uh, a lot of people realizing that the Charter uh, supports people with disabilities moving across borders without, in, in Canada, without any type of uh, limitations. So uh, some of this legislation is going to probably bite the dust. British Columbia, probably the strongest uh, certification process. It requires uh, from, uh, require, uh, certification is required from a, an accredited school, either Assistance Dog International or the International Guide Dog Federation certified facilities, or pass a test. Certification does not include comfort or therapy dogs. There's a big concern, like even people from Manitoba, that if they went out with their service dog to BC, they have to get a temporary certificate if the dog is trained by ADI or IGDF, or you'd have to pass a test. So that's a real imposition on a person who's traveling to family purposes or whatever with their guide dog. A fine of up to $3,000 for fraudulent dogs. 
But BC is now faced with a constitutional challenge on the limitations of the legislation. Uh, just, I was just informed by the lawyer who launched it on behalf of uh, a group, I think it's a dog user group. Ontario issues uh, ID cards under the Blind Persons Rights Act. There's little distinction between service or comfort animals and they're not focused, focused on the level of training. Um, I also also asked to give a comparison with the Americans. The Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, uh, service animals are defined as dogs that are individually trained to do work or perform tasks for persons with disabilities, same as us. Under the ADA, state and local governments, businesses and nonprofit organizations that serve the public generally, they must allow service animals to accompany people with disabilities in all areas of the facility where the public is normally allowed to go, similar to us. Similar to Manitoba, when it's not obvious what, a ser what service an animal provides, only limited inquiries are allowed. Staff may ask two questions. Is the dog a service animal required because of a disability? And two, what work or task has the dog been trained to perform? Staff cannot ask about the person's disability, require medical documentation, require a special ID card, or training documentation for the dog, or ask that the dog demonstrate its ability to perform the work or task. Unlike Canada, the ADA has separate provision for miniature horses as service animals. I, I got to keep on thinking about that one in the school. <laughs> um, so there's many issues for schools, and some of them have come up, and, and they've hit the media in the last couple of years. Um, is the dog assisting a person with a disability? What service is the dog, dog trained to provide? Now in the school, you realize that you have to dig a little deeper to find out where this request is coming from, whether it fits into the child's um, programming and planning. So the schools that are given a little extra allowance by the Human Rights Commission to look into some of this. Is it a service animal or a comfort animal or a family pet? We've had, I've heard of schools that have had someone want the family pet to come with the child to school. And if you ever want to see, um, I guess, uh, how many dog lovers are, or how alarmed people can get about a dog coming into a school, um, if, if the rumor gets out that this may happen, all of a sudden, all the kids, or many of the kids are coming with allergy documentation. Staff are coming with allergy documentation. And that has happened in some places. So there has to be a way of working through that all because it can lead to some conflicts in the schools. Um, is the request for comfort animal a need or a want? Um, the Human Rights Code differentiates between needs and wants. Who recommended a service animal or a comfort animal? We have a physician that sits on our committee and uh, she, she said that uh, physicians aren't trained in service animals, um, how they help or when they're appropriate. Schools may encounter situations where a dog is recommended, but there's no diagnosed medical condition. That leads to uh, some real question marks. Does the level of training of the animal make it safe around other students and staff? Can the student care for the dog at school? That's one of the recommendations of the uh, Human Rights Commission. How will a service animal be introduced to the school community? How will the service animal be identified? Um, another one is that, that has arisen. Is a service or comfort animal necessary if there's continuous supervision of a student in the school? Uh, the other one is uh, how will allergies amongst students and staff be addressed? Many of those questions have been addressed because I. I keep going out to school divisions and I ask people, do you have any dogs in your schools? And there's always a school division that says, yes, we've got a couple here, there, and everywhere. And I went to some adult alternative learning centers in one of the school divisions, three of them in a row, and the dog came running to the door to meet us. Now that's a pet in the classroom for, in those particular circumstances. Anyway, a couple of years ago I was involved in this. It was recommended by Manitoba Education that Manitoba School Divisions develop service animal policies due to increasing requests by parents. After the revision of policies by the Human Rights Code, now we have to rewrite that one because they're saying that service animals do not have to be certified or trained by a recognized training program and that comfort animals must be shown reasonable accommodation. That's new as of last August. So my closing comments, I look forward to the development of uh, the CGSB national standards on service dogs and they are calling them service dogs, not service animals. Hopefully they'll clear up the confusion regarding persons with disabilities using service animals, the responsibilities of service providers, 
and the differences between the province. If the Supreme Court allows unrestricted movement of beer across provincial borders, we should at least be able to get the seat for service animals. <laughs> uh, if if uh, any of you have ever studied on the change process, I think a couple of years ago in Manitoba we were storming because there was some confusion about uh, some of the animals. Now some of the in things that are going on with the Human Rights Commission were forming and down the road will be warming and hopefully the federal government can ask, help us with that. I just want to leave with one final comment and this one I came across, I get all sorts of journals across my desk and I, I was looking again at a, the title of this session. So this is an, uh, an article on animal assisted interventions for children with autism spectrum disorder, a systematic review where they look at all the other research articles. It was in Education and Training in Autism and Developmental Disabilities just last September. And they reviewed 20 studies on using therapy dogs. Now I have to look closer at what their definition of therapy dogs was. They concluded with, because of contradictory findings and research design limitations, additional inquiry is needed. As such, caregivers and practitioners should exercise caution in selecting uh, as animal assisted interventions as part of an intervention package for children uh, with ASD. It's just a, a comment that I came across because I always like to see the proof. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Doug. That was uh, really interesting. I especially like hearing about the, um, the differences between the provinces. And <laughs> I had to chuckle when you talked about miniature horses being therapy animals. It was quite something to picture. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, we'd like to open it up to questions. If anyone has any questions, um, you can shout it out or we can bring over a mic if you can't be heard. My question would be about Mac. Um, labs are lovely, very intelligent, but they also have that instinct to be drawn to water and to want a lot of exercise. So yeah. you did uh, really well in stopping him. Yeah. Mac is terrified. Okay. <laughs> in our case, no, he is not drawn to water, so he doesn't okay. be allowed to water. He actually, feel, he's frantic, like we live out of lake. So he's frantic if Madden's in the water, and he'll just pace back and forth until oh. Madden's in the water. Yes. How does it work with Mac and Madden at school? Is Madden responsible for cleaning up Mac's messes? Does he? Uh, no, his EA uh, is responsible. She's agreed. She was our tutor from ABA, who continued on to be his EA at school. So she was there. She's trained. She's a uh, trained handler for the MSAR with our dog and um, with Madden. Um, so she takes. She assumes the responsibility. Yes. I have a follow-up question. Did you do anything special to introduce Mac to the whole school community and to do some education with the kids about um, patting Mac or? So it's a little bit different for us because of the size of our community. So Madden is well known in the community even prior to autism or his dog. He was uh, a roots of empathy baby at our school. Um, I mean, his, his, his grade size is only for kids in his grade. Uh, in his immediate class, there's only 15 kids all, like in the morning, and then in the afternoon, there's only six. So I mean, we're very limited on the families we need to reach. And then families that we are reaching all know us, right? So the introduction for not being able to pet our dog is it, it's easy because they see them everywhere. Uh, so every September we do reintroduce to the new kids that are coming in for that new school year. But I mean, for example, next year I was telling Doug, we have two students joining next year. So I mean, these two students already know Madden and Mac from various activities in our community. So it's not difficult for us. But I mean, I can see in a larger school and a larger community where it would be very difficult to educate everybody that attends school. <coughs> Um, is there any place that, where would he go to provide his training for the pets if you have anybody interested in training there and there are dogs? Is there multiple places or is it not something you said? Um, well, I'll hand it off to Anita and also to Barb to answer that, and they can talk about um, kind of where they can go. Because you're, are you thinking for more um, therapy dogs? More Um, and I'd like to try to do that into 
do our facilities to help facilities with their care. <coughs> okay. Okay, so I understand you have dogs that you were thinking about getting the temperament evaluated to have in your facility, is that correct? Correct. Um, yeah, with the St. John Ambulance test, as I, I recall it, they do have um, a panel of evaluators from the, the dog training world. They do have a behaviorist and a trainer. Um, so they do, like throughout the evaluation, they determine um, like the suitability for a dog for certain facilities. Um, so you could contact them through the, the website. Um, their pet therapy program is separate um, for most of their other uh, community programs. But um, yeah, if you do have any questions, um, just uh, go to the website and contact them and they would be more than happy to uh, answer any questions you might have. Does that answer your question? Is that the only one? It's, it's the only one that I'm familiar with. I'm sure there are others. Um, I don't know, Barb, if you have. Uh, the program that Carco and I and, and Bear went uh, with a group called Manitoba Search and Rescue, uh, which is the same organization that Kristen was, uh, their dog was trained with them as well. Uh, and it, it's a much, it was a much different, more intensive program in the fact that it lasted for six months uh, so that the people who were working on the program could in fact evaluate your dog all the time and know whether in fact the dog was going to be solid. I had a number of dogs that I would never ever have attacked, attempted to have done this with. And so the behavior, as Anita was talking about, a behaviorist is it's important for them to be able to see what in fact is actually going on. Um, George Leonard, who was the trainer with, that I worked with uh, during that uh, time period, is spending most of his time right now on post-traumatic stress syndrome and uh, rescuing dogs and hooking them up with, um, with soldiers that have come back. So that's where his uh, that's where his energies are are uh, going right now. And um, other than that, uh, St. John Ambulance, uh, which is a different type of program uh, altogether, um, it's limited. I think is it not done in the things that you even researched as to? I've only found out about the assessment that they do, so I don't know if they go beyond that. Okay. But um, I know that George Leonard was very keen on working towards people uh, training dogs at, right across Canada so that, that everybody has the same standard. I think that's the sli slippery slope that we're into right now is the fact that everybody may say they've got a therapy dog or a service dog, but in fact, how do you know where that dog was trained? and how do you know, in fact, that that dog is solid? And so people have been saying that they have a therapy dog when, in fact, the dog is not a, a certified therapy dog. So they're hoping, because this whole dog thing in schools and the workplace has taken off. It's huge now. And, of course, you want to have dogs that have been trained properly. And it should be Canada-wide in the fact that the dogs, when you take your dog somewhere, you want to make sure that the dog has been trained properly and that you have the credentials to honestly go out and say, I believe in this dog and I believe that it's going to be able to do what I want it to do and how it was trained to do. Does that answer? <laughs> Hi, Barb. Um, how old is Cargo and how old was he when you started training him? Uh, they suggest that the dog is two, should be two when they start. Bear uh, actually was a little bit younger and we started into the schools when he was two. Um, Andrea will attest to this, that uh, when she first asked us to go to the group home uh, with St. Amant and I had Bear at that time, um, I took Bear and he was, he was great, but I also had Cargo at the time and I had also trained him, but I hadn't had him in the schools. And so I said to Andrea, do you think I could bring Cargo just to sort of see how 
he's going to react to this new place. And she said, sure, bring him in, it's fine. So White Cargo and I went to the home and uh, we couldn't get him in the house. <laughs> he ran around the yard, I tripped and fell and he <laughs> picked me up. She chased the dog, we, <laughs> we were all over the place. So I thought, you know what, this dog is never going to be able to be a therapy dog. And here he is today, he's been pretty good. And uh, it just, he, dogs uh, mature at different levels and at different times according to the breed of dog. And you have to be cognizant of that as well. So he couldn't have ever gone into the schools at the age of two or even into the training program. So he he's, would have to be older because of the type of dog he is. Uh, he will be nine this year, and so we've been working in the schools for two years. So he started in when he was seven. Oh, and I just want to say, sorry. Um, he's wearing a vest that says, do not pet, do not feed. I got all your names of all you people who... <laughs> Best. He wears the best to show that he's a certified trained dog. Um, and the reason that he has a vest like this is when we go to the teddy bear's picnic, or when we go to malls, or when we go to fundraisers, uh, when we go to, to big uh, get-togethers, that we don't have everybody on top of him. So it's all right for you to pat him. You can feed me, but you can pat him. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, is there some breeds of dogs that like particularly make good service dogs? I think Doug was just talking about that earlier today. When I met with uh, George Leonard, who was the Manitoba Search and Rescue, uh, he just uh, made a comment. I'm trying to think of the third breed, but he made a comment that in conjunction with these standards, he also also identified breeds of dogs that seemed to be better. And I'm going on my memory here. I thought he said Golden Retriever. I think he said Lab. And there was one cross, but I can't remember what that Labrador. Okay. So those those three, I guess, from an uninformed person like me. Part of it. Okay. Yeah, the cross cross. Yeah. Yeah. Any last questions before we wrap it up? So, um, I just would like to thank everyone for coming out um, and coming to this session. I hope you took as much out of the presentations as I did. Um,